All right, continuing on, we're now going to review the concept of a sampling distribution. So a statistic computed from a random sample is a random variable itself. It's a function of the random sample, and so therefore, it's a random variable. Because it's a random variable, it has a probability distribution. The sampling distribution of a statistic is just the probability distribution of that statistic. Now our goal in doing inferential statistics is to use sample statistics to make inferences about population parameters. To do this, we'll need to know something about how the sample statistics behave. Now that behavior, that behavior of a sample statistic is contained in the statistics sampling distribution. So it's, uh, it's very important then that we uh, understand uh, uh, something about the sampling distribution of a statistic. Now we'll be interested in understanding uh, certain characteristics about uh, a, sampling, a statistic sampling distribution, such as the mean of the distribution, I'm sorry, the mean of the sampling distribution, the variance of the sampling distribution, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, which, by the way, is also called the statistics sam uh, standard error, all right, standard error. And then uh, we would also like to know something about the shape of the sampling distribution, for example, whether it's symmetric or skewed. Um, and if we, could, uh, if we could get it, we'd like to also know the exact uh, sampling distribution. Uh, for example, we'd like to know it's PDF or it's PMF. All right, typically we are not gonna know that exactly. Uh, we may know some, uh, something about uh, an approximation to the sampling distribution but typically we would not know the exact sampling distribution. But for starters, we want to uh, think about trying to understand these particular uh, characteristics of the sampling distribution. Now, to get into this, let's, uh, I want to look at, a, at an example. And this is a very simple example. In fact, it's probably the simplest possible example that we, one could ever come up with all right, to uh, talk about sampling distributions, but I like it uh, because it's really easy to uh, draw out for one, and it's easy to wrap our heads around. And so here's, here's the example. Um, we have a population. This population consists of three values. The three values are one, two, and three. So again, it's a very, very simple population. Now, what we're going to do in this example, uh, a couple things. First, we want to find the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of the population. Now, that's going to be very easy. We know the formulas for that. But now, uh, or after we do that, what we want to do next is consider taking samples of size little n equal to 2 from this population, and in particular, taking samples with replacement. All right, so the idea would be uh, one way to... Uh, conceptually or conceptualize this. Suppose we have uh, a hat with uh, three slips of paper. Uh, three slips of each, each slip of paper has a number, either one, two, or three. All right, and so that's our population. And uh, in this sampling process, what we're going to do is, uh, you know, mix up, make sure that the slips of paper are mixed up, and then we're going to reach into the hat without looking. We're going to pull out a slip of paper. We look at the paper, we see the number written down, or, or that's on the uh, slip. We write that number down on a separate sheet of paper, and then we put the slip, the paper, back in. So uh, we're replacing that slip of paper back into the hat. Then we mix the uh, pieces of paper up again, and then reach in again without looking and pull out a slip the second time. We look at that number, and we write it down and put the slip back. So that would be uh, sampling at random because we're not looking and the, and the slips of paper are mixed up. And with replacement, we put uh, the slip of paper back after we've looked at it and written down the number. So that is the uh, process that we're going to use for sampling. All right? And so what, in doing this, we uh, want to find uh, the sampling distribution of the sample mean for this sampling process, in particular for samples of size n equal to 2. All right, and so, and then after that, we want to find the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample mean, again, for samples of size n equal to 2.
All right, so did you follow that? We're going to consider the process of taking random samples of size little n equal to 2 from this population. Again, we're uh, taking samples with replacement. All right, and then once we have the two values, we're going to calculate the sample mean for that sample. Now, that sample mean is a random variable. It has a distribution. And so we're going to first find the distribution of the sample mean, in particular, uh, the sampling distribution. And then we're going to uh, calculate uh, some properties or characteristics of that distribution, in particular, uh, the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of that sampling distribution. Now let's first calculate the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of the population. Okay, and so uh, the population mean will be denoted by lowercase Greek letter mu. And then the formula for the mean of a uh, discrete population is 1 over cap n times the sum i going from 1 up to cap n of the x sub i's, where capital N is the uh, size of the population. In this case, we've got three observations, three values in that population. So capital N is 3. And then x1 is 1, x2 is 2, x3 is 3. All right, and so this is the calculation that we use uh, to calculate the, the uh, population mean for a discrete uh, population. All right, so it's a very simple calculation, and we get a value of 2. So the mean of the population, mu sub x, is 2. Next, we want to calculate the variance of this population. And you'll recall that for a finite uh, population, the uh, population variance is calculated this way. It's the average squared deviation about the mean, right? The mean is 2, right? x1 is 1, x2 is 2, x3 is 3, all right? And so it's, the, the, uh, it's 1 over n, 1 over cap n, times uh, the sum, i going from 1 to cap n of x sub i minus mu sub x quantity squared. And so we have one third times uh, this sum, so one minus two quantity squared, two minus two quantity squared plus three minus two quantity squared. And you can see here that we get two thirds. So the variance of this population uh, is two thirds, very easy to calculate. And then to get the population standard deviation, uh, we just take the square root of two-thirds. By the way, notice that the population variance is denoted by lowercase uh, Greek letter sigma squared, all right, and the population standard deviation is just sigma. So those are the calculations for calculating uh, these three characteristics of this population. One is a measure of location. Uh, two of these are measures of dispersion population mean, the population variance, and the population standard deviation. All right, now let's think about uh, taking samples of size 2 with replacement. All right, and so I guess the first thing I would ask is how many possible samples are there? All right, we've got three uh, values in the population. We're going to be selecting samples of size uh, little n equal to 2, uh, sampled with replacement. And so because of that, uh, there are three ways, three values that we could get when we uh, select the first observation. And then because we put that slip of paper back, there are three ways that uh, we could get, or three values that we could get for the second value. And so by the fundamental rule of counting, there are three times three or nine uh, possible ways that the two values could be selected for our sample. And so there are nine samples of size two uh, taken with replacement from this population of three values. Now associated with each of those samples, uh, we've got two observations. Those two sample values have a, have a mean, right? So we would be uh, calculating the sample mean. We could also calculate the sample variance and so forth. Now here is a schematic of this process. So we have our population up here containing the values 1, 2, and 3. The mean of 
This population is two, as we found. The variance of this population is two thirds. Now, there are nine possible samples that we can obtain uh, in sampling with replacement from this population. We could get a one on the first draw and a one on the second draw. We could get a one on the first draw and a two on the second draw, a one on the first draw and a three on the second draw. On the other hand, we could get a two on the first draw and a one on the second draw, a two on the first draw, a two on the second draw, a two on the first draw and a three on the second draw. And then finally, uh, the last three possibilities, we could get a three on the first draw, a, a one on the second draw, we could get a three on the first draw and a two on the second draw, and then we could get three on both draws. Again, because uh, we are sampling with replacement, once we look at that number and write it down, we put that slip of paper back into that hat, and so it can be, it can be selected twice. Now, for each of these nine samples, we can calculate the average of the sample. And so for this first sample over here, where both observations are one, obviously the mean of that sample is one. For the sample that contains a one and a two, that sample mean is three halves. The mean of the sample containing a one on the first draw and a three on the second draw is uh, two. And you, you know, we continue on, we can see what these uh, sample means are. Now, if we, if we take an inventory, if we look through here and take an inventory of uh, the unique values that the sample mean takes on, we see that uh, the unique values are one, three halves, two, five halves, and three. Now, because of the way that we are sampling from this population, Right? Remember, we're reaching into that hat and we're pulling out a slip of paper at random, noting the number, writing it down, and then putting that paper back and then doing that a second time. By virtue of how we're performing that experiment, all nine uh, of these outcomes, these elementary events, are equally likely. And that means that uh, each, of these each of these events, each of these possible outcomes has a probability of one over nine, one ninth. Okay, and so to compute the probability of an event uh, involving this experiment, uh, all we have to do is count the number of ways to find the probability of that event. All we have to do is count, or count the number of ways that the event can occur, and then divide by nine. Okay, so uh, what is the probability in, in performing this experiment that we get a sample whose mean is one? Well, we look through here. There's only one sample where that happens. That's the sample where we get one both times. And so the probability that X bar is equal to one is one ninth. What is the probability that we get a sample whose mean is three halves? Well, we scan through here. We see that there are two samples where that happens. All right, this sample where we get a one on the first draw and a two on the second draw. The other sample would be when we get a two on the first draw and a one on the second draw. And so the probability of our obtaining a sample, the mean of which is three halves, is two ninths. The probability that, X is, uh, that we get a sample whose mean is uh, two is equal to three ninths. That's because uh, if we look through here, we have one, two, three samples where the sample mean is two. Similarly, because there are only two samples where uh, the uh, sample mean is five halves, uh, this sample here, when we get a three on the first draw and a two on the second draw, and then this uh, sample where we get a, a two on the first draw and a three on the second draw, uh, the probability of, of our getting a sample whose mean is five halves is two ninths. And then finally, the probability of our getting a sample, the mean of which is three, is just one ninth because uh, there's only one such sample. Now you'll notice that uh, the sum of these various probabilities, these five probabilities, is one, which it uh, needs to be. If we get something less than one, we, then we've not accounted for something, and if we get something more than one, well, we've made a mistake somewhere. So whenever we create a PDF, or I'm sorry, a PMF, and that's what this is. This is a PMF because it, it lists, uh, lists the values in the sample space of X bar, the sample space of X bar containing the values one, three halves, two, five halves, and three, 
all right? And then it gives us the probabilities associated with each of those outcomes. So these two columns, this tabular, this table here, uh, is a tabular representation for the PMF for the mean of a random sample of size little n equal to two samples taken with replacement from this population. So this is one way to uh, represent schematically or pictorially uh, what we're talking about. Another way to represent this is with uh, a table, for example, created in a uh, word processor, for example, and we know that there are nine possible samples, so I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spots here, nine rows in my table, in the body of my table. And uh, what I could do is fill out this table with uh, the sample number in the first column, and then the sample values uh, for x1 and x2, the two random variables comprising my sample, uh, so list the values of x1 and x2 for each possible sample. So it would be, they would have these numbers, all right? And so if I were to do that, then this is what uh, that part of the table would look like. So again, I've got uh, my nine possible samples and uh, I could uh, summarize, I could, calc I could calculate uh, uh, summaries of these uh, values for each column and I'll do that and uh, I could also calculate the mean for each of my uh, nine samples and put them in this column. All right, and I've done that here. And I've also calculated uh, the sum and the mean, uh, as well as the variance of those values. Um, now, let me just point out here that in calculating uh, uh, summary values for uh, these columns, uh, I'm actually using population formulas. And the reason is because this, uh, these uh, row or the, the, this collection of rows constitutes uh, the, sam the entire sampling distribution uh, of X bar, right? The, the, uh, in all the possible sam samples of size two with replacement that we could take, all right, uh, these are all the possibilities. And so when we calculate these summary values down here, these uh, descriptive statistics, we're actually calcul calculating these using the population formulas. And that particularly implies, uh, applies uh, to the variance formulas down here. So we'll come back to this uh, part in a minute. Now we could also, for each of our nine samples, calculate uh, the sample variance and uh, also x1 times x2. And I'm, I'm gonna do this, we'll use these later. All right, I've done that here. Uh, what we're gonna focus on are uh, the values in this column here because we're really interested in the sampling distribution of the sample mean at this point, all right? Later we'll focus on the sampling distribution of the sample variance, but right now we're focusing on the sampling distribution of the sample mean, and so we need to look at the possible values that X bar takes on, okay? Now, let's calculate, well, let me back up. So we, we were to um, construct the sampling distribution for X-bar, and we've done that here down in the lower left corner. Okay, so now the next task is to uh, compute the mean of the sampling distribution of X-bar. Okay, and so that's denoted this way, mu sub X-bar, the mean of the sampling distribution of X-bar. We can also denote it as the expected value of X, I'm sorry, the expected value of X bar, all right? And by definition, that is going to be equal to the sum over the values in the sample space of X bar times uh, F of X bar, where F is the uh, PMF of X bar, which we, uh, it's, the, it's the PMF for the sampling distribution of X bar, which we have found. And so, the values in the sample space of X bar, we found were one, three halves, two, five halves, and three. The probabilities associated with those uh, values in the sample space were one ninth, two ninths, three ninths, two ninths, and one ninth. And so we apply this formula, we get this sum, it's a weighted sum or a weighted average really, okay? And when you uh, calculate that weighted average, you get 
18 over 9 or 2. So the mean of the sampling distribution of x-bar, right, the place at which it's centered, the expected value of x-bar is equal to 2.0. Next, let's find the variance of the sampling distribution of x-bar. Okay, and so we're going to use the computational formula to do this. And so the first thing I need to do is to find the expected value of x-bar squared. Now, by definition, that's going to be the sum over the values of x-bar in its sample space of x-bar squared times uh, the PMF of x-bar evaluated at each of those values of x-bar. And so we have 1 squared times 1 ninth plus 3 half squared times 2 ninths plus 2 squared times 3 ninths plus 5, uh, five half squared uh, times 2 ninths plus 3 squared times 1 ninth. And so when we go and do that calculation, we get, uh, turns out to be 156 over 36. And I'll leave it over, uh, I'll leave it as a fraction over 36. All right, so we found the expected value of x squared, x bar squared, I'm sorry. Now we're going to use the computational formula to get the, the uh, variance of the distribution of x bar. And so sigma squared sub x bar, which is also denoted by uh, var of x bar. Using the computational formula, this is the expected value of x bar squared minus the square of the expected value of x bar, which you'll remember we found to be 2, right? And so we have 156 over 36 minus 2 squared or minus 4. And then that turns out to be 156 minus 144 over 36, which simplifies uh, to 1 third. So the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar is uh, 2. The variance of the sampling distribution of x bar is 1 third. And once we have the variance of the uh, sampling distribution of x bar, we can find the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar, also called its standard error, uh, by just taking the square root of the variance of the sampling distribution of x bar. And so uh, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar is the square root of one third. Now I also want to take a few minutes to talk about statistical or stochastic independence. Now by definition, two random variables x1 and x2 are stochastically independent if and only if the probability that uh, x1 takes on a value of little x1 and x2 takes on a value of little x2 only if and only if that probability, that joint probability is equal to the product of these individual probabilities. In other words, the probability that x bar, x1, I'm sorry, x1 takes on a value little x1 times the probability that x2 takes on a value little x2. Now these values of little x1 and little x2 are, these are the possible values in the sample spaces of x1 and x2 respectively. So again, in order for, uh, x1 and x2 to be stochastically independent, this relationship between uh, this, these joint probabilities and the product of these uh, individual probabilities has to hold for all possible values of x1 and x2 in the sample spaces of the random variables x1 and x2. Now, in this uh, particular example that we're working, right, where we're select looking at samples of size uh, little n equal to 2 taken with replacement from this uh, population with three values. In, this, in that example, the two random variables that comprise our sample, x1 and x2, are indeed stochastically independent. And it's very easy to show that uh, by uh, showing that this definition holds. And so the sample space of x1, which will, uh, s1 here, Okay, so I had a bit of a typo, but I've corrected that. So the sample space of X1 will be denoted by um, script, X, uh, script S1, and it contains the values 1, 2, and 3. Now, by virtue of how we're selecting that first uh, 
sample value. Remember, we're pulling numbers out of a hat. Each one has the same probability of occurrence. So each one of these possibilities, each one of these outcomes has a probability of one third. In the same way, the sample space of X2 is the same set of values. And that's because we're putting that uh, slip of paper back, right? So we have the same possible outcomes at one, two, and three. And uh, it has the same probability structure. So each one of those uh, possible, or probable, or each one of those outcomes, let's put it that way, has a probability of one third. Now the joint sample space of X1 and X2 contains uh, the nine points as we've seen, right? Those nine possible samples. And I'll denote that's joint sample space by script S about one comma two, all right? And so it's the set of ordered pairs X1 and X2 where X1 can be either one, two, or three. And regardless of whatever X1 is, X2 can also be one, two, or three. Now because sampling is done at random and with replacement, each one of these nine possible outcomes, as we've seen, has a probability of one over nine. In other words, the probability that x1 is equal to a value, say i, and x2 is equal to a value, let's call it j, where i is either one, two, or three, and j is either one, two, or three, that probability is going to be one ninth for all uh, values of i and j. And so we see then that the probability that x1 is equal to i and x2 is equal to j, which is 1 9th, that is in fact equal to 1 3rd times 1 3rd, which is the product uh, probability, uh, well, 1 3rd is equal to the probability that x1 is equal to i, and this 1 3rd is the probability that x2 is equal to j. And so we see that this, uh, this relationship holds this defining relationship for stochastic independence holds for all values of ij in uh, the sample space of x1 and x2. And so then it follows that x1 and x2 are indeed stochastically independent. Now, x1 and x2 are stochastically independent in this case because of the way we are performing the experiment. In particular, because we are uh, replacing that first slip of paper after we look at it and write down the number. Because we're putting it back, what we see here is that that causes uh, the two random variables uh, to be independent, stochastically independent. Now, stochastic independence implies zero covariance. It can be shown that if two random variables, x1 and x2, are stochastically independent, then their covariance is zero. Now that implies that their correlation is zero as well, okay, because the uh, correlation between two random variables is equal to the covariance of those two random variables divided by the square root of the product of the variances. So uh, the correlation will be zero if and only if the covariance is zero. Now the covariance between two random variables, x1 and x2, uh, which is denoted this way, COV, covariance. So the cove of x1 and x2 is defined in terms of expectation, all right? It's defined in terms uh, of an expectation involving uh, the joint distribution of x1 and x2. And in particular, it's the expected value of the product of x1 minus its expected value and x2 minus its expected value. So this first expression is the defining formula, uh, again expressed in terms of expectation for the covariance of x1 and x2. And it turns out that uh, just as there was a computational formula for variance, there's also this nice computational formula for the covariance. And in particular, uh, it's this uh, computational formula tells us that the covariance of x1 and x2 that can be computed by first computing the expected value of the product of x1 and x2, and then from that subtracting the product of the expected value of x1 and the expected value of x2. So these two uh, expressions are equivalent. Uh, to get from the first to the second, we just need to uh, utilize some properties of expectation, but again, it's not a complicated derivation. We're not gonna show it, but it's not complicated. But we do need to uh, 
understand that both of these can be used. Now, remember what we're talking about here. Stochastic independence implies zero covariance. And so if what this means uh, is that if we know that two random variables are stochastically independent, then uh, we can conclude without having to do any calculations that they, may, may, that they must have zero covariance as well. Okay, so that's one way that we can use uh, this particular result. So we showed uh, in the previous two or three slides that uh, in this particular sampling framework, this sampling from this finite population with replacement, that the two random variables x1 and x2 are in fact stochastically independent. And so based on this result, we can conclude without having to do any calculations at all that the covariance of x1 and x2 must be zero. Now, to verify this, uh, you know, I, I, what I want to do is go through the exercise of ac actually calculating the covariance, just so that you see an example of that, but also to verify uh, the truth of this result. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. Okay, so we saw that the expected value of x1 was 2, and the expected value of x2 was 2 as well. Uh, now, where did we see this? Let me scroll back to a previous slide. And in fact, let me just insert it here, all right? So going from uh, this slide, all right? Let's take a look again at this uh, table that we filled out. Now, at the time we filled it out, we were uh, focused on uh, the, uh, this column here. And so these are the possible values for, uh, that X bar can take on. Now, notice that we calculated here the, the mean and the variance of this uh, sampling distribution of values. And the mean we found to be two, the variance was one third. Now, we calculated those uh, values using uh, the formulas for expectation, but we could just as easily have calculated those values by calculating the uh, mean of these values and then the uh, population variance of those values as well. So what th this uh, quantity represents right here, this two, this is the expected value of X bar. And then the one third represents the variance of X bar. Now, likewise, uh, we have uh, the corresponding values of X1 for the nine samples, the values of X2 in the nine samples. Uh, and we also have uh, this last column, the values of X1 times X2 uh, corresponding to each of the nine samples. Now, if we calculate the mean for a particular column, what that represents is the expected value of that quantity, whichever one it happens to be. If we calculate the variance of a particular uh, column of values, then that corresponds to the variance of whatever quantity we're looking at. So the expected value of x1 is 2, the expected value of x2 is 2, and the expected value of x1 times x2 turns out to be 4. Okay? All right. And so that's what I'm talking about when I say we have shown via that table that the expected value of x1 is 2, the expected value of x2 is 2, and that the expected value of x1 times x2 is 4. Now, using the computational formula for the covariance of x1 and x2, we have the expected value of x1 times x2 minus the product of the expected value of x1 and the expected value of x2. And so we have 4 minus 2 times 2, 4 minus 4, that's just 0. And so what we've shown here is that the covariance of x1 and x2 for this situation, right, where we're sampling with replacement, the covariance of x1 and x2 is equal to 0. Now, we already knew that it was going to be 0 because of this result here.
If two random variables are stochastically independent, then their covariance must be zero. All right, so we really didn't even need to do this calculation, but I wanted to do it just to verify with you that that is indeed the case. Now, the important, one important uh, implication of this is that non-zero covariance or non-zero correlation implies stochastic dependence. So stochastically independent random variables, x1 and x2, must have zero covariance and hence zero correlation. It follows that if two random variables, x1 and x2, have non-zero covariance, then they must not be stochastically independent because if they were stochastically independent, they would necessarily have to have a zero covariance. But if that covariance is non-zero, that implies that uh, they must not be stochastically independent. And if they're not stochastically independent, we say that they are stochastically dependent. So that's going to be very important for us to understand as we uh, move into uh, a different uh, type of sampling framework. But for right now, our focus is the type of sampling framework that you looked at in your first methods course. Uh, in that first methods course, you were looking at uh, what are just called random samples without any kind of uh, uh, adjective uh, or anything like that, just in general, random sampling. And what, but what that really implies is you're either sampling from an infinite population or if you're, you happen to be sampling from a finite population, like which we have been in this example, then you're sampling with replacement. Okay, so this, this discussion of stochastic independence uh, and uh, the fact that if uh, two random variables are stochastically independent, they must have non-zero correlation. And the implic uh, I'm sorry, they must have zero correlation. They must have zero correlation. And the implication uh, from that being that if two random variables have non-zero correlation, then they must not be independent. They would have to be stochastically dependent. Okay, that's important for us to consider, but uh, let's get back to uh, the other uh, things that we were talking about. We'll come back to the independence and, and so forth later. So getting back to uh, the calculations that we've done, uh, let's look at the relationship between the sampling distribution of the sample mean and uh, the population. Now note that in this particular example, Right In this example that we are currently looking at, the mean and the variance of the sampling distribution of the sample mean are related to the population mean and population variance in the following way. All right, Again, in this example, what we're seeing is that the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar is 2. But that was the value of the mean of the population itself. In addition, the variance of the sampling distribution of x bar was found to be one-third. But notice that I can write that as two-thirds over two. And the two-thirds over two is equal to the variance of the population that we're sampling from divided by little n, right? The variance of uh, the population we're sampling from was two-thirds, and little n is two. And so in this example, the mean and the variance of the sampling distribution of x bar are related to the mean and the variance of the population via these relationships. Now the question is, uh, is this just a coincidence or is there some underlying principle at work? And so it turns out that this is a general result. So let's consider these general results uh, involving the sampling distribution of the sample mean. Let x bar be the mean of a random sample of size little n from a population with mean mu and variance sigma squared. Denote the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of x bar by mu sub x bar, sigma squared sub x bar, and sigma sub x bar respectively then it can be shown, we're not going to prove these things, but we've demonstrated them, right, in that example, but it can be shown, it can be proven, that it's always going to be the case, always, that the mean of the sampling distribution of x bar 
will always be equal to the mean of the population from which the sample has been obtained. In addition, the variance of the sampling distribution of X bar will always be equal to the variance of the population we're sampling from divided by the sample size. And therefore, the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of X bar will always be equal to the standard deviation of the population that we're sampling from divided by the square root of the sample size. And so this will always be the case. Now when I say always, what I mean is if we have the same kind of sampling framework that we're talking about, if, either, if we're either sampling from an infinite population or if, uh, if we're sampling from a finite population, then we're sampling with replacement, okay? And that is the kind of sampling framework that uh, you looked at in your first methods class or classes, right? That's the only type of sampling framework that you considered, right? You probably remember these uh, relationships from uh, your first methods class or classes. And again, these results hold uh, if you're sampling from a, an infinite population or if you happen to be sampling from a finite population, then you're sampling with replacement. But now what if we're sampling from a, a finite population and we're sampling without replacement? Well, then that's a different sampling framework and these formulas may not hold. In fact, they won't hold. And so that is why, that, that is one of the purposes of, of even having this course, because the only sampling framework, the only sampling technique that you, can, that you were exposed to in your first methods course uh, is uh, that which is called random sampling. And what that means, uh, what is contained in that uh, terminology is you're either sampling from an infinite population where having to replace observations doesn't matter, or if you're sampling from a finite population, you're sampling with replacement. And the method, the, the techniques uh, that you, uh, st the statistical methodologies or techniques that you uh, learn in that class, and in particular, those techniques that you, uh, involved standard errors uh, or estimated standard errors are based on this result here. But if you're doing some other kind of a sampling framework, some other kind of a sampling procedure or technique, then these formulas no longer apply, and we have to uh, learn what those what the what the appropriate formulas would be. This is a good place to stop for this video. What I want to do is is uh, we'll continue on talking about sampling distributions and using the sample mean to make inferences about population uh, means in the in the next video.